Good evening and welcome to this episode of Beers and Bites with your hosts, Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Murdishaw of Fortify 24-7. This evening's special guest is Manish Gupta, who is the founder and CEO of Shift Left. Now, as I understand that he's had previous roles at McAfee and FireEye, and he has held many different board positions that we may just have to explore during this episode. But with that, uh, what we'd like to do now is start with Chris, and let's talk about the beer that you've brought this year. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I brought my favorite. This is the, the Mosaic Goat. Um, two silo, solid. And then I'm going to go, normally the face plant is more popular for this brand. This is Lost Rhino, and they got the Ride the Tide New England Pale Ale. So these are two nice pints, kicking in around 8 9%. So th- th- we're going to be doing good tonight. Jeremy? <laughs> Well, uh, let's see, a 10 percenter, it's called uh, Finger Guns from uh, Lucky Luke, which is a local brewery here in the uh, Southern California area. Uh, double IPA, 10%, great start, to the, great start to the conversation. And we'll follow up with a, a 6.7 uh, Bravery IPA from uh, Bravery Brewing Company. Nice. All right, Manish, what did you bring this evening? Oh boy, I feel like I have the boring one here, but here it is. Um, I have, I'm a stout fan, and it says uh, peanut butter milk stout by. Oh, Dutch it's a Beaver. it's a milk stout too. <laughs> oh wow, that's great. <laughs> Goodness, well, this evening I have uh, brought a Voodoo Ranger IPA, uh, probably just at seven percent. I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> again, I can't take credit for it. I have to give it to my wife, who does the shopping. So. <laughs> with that sorry let's go ahead and get started then uh Manish, again it, as we introduced you are the ceo and, and founder of uh shift left why don't you tell us a little bit about shift left and and what the company does and and, and why you're there doing that and, and you know what uh, gap are you filling in the marketplace yeah of course thank you al well <clears throat> chris and i got a chance to work at mcafee together so uh, he remembers that i spent about 15 years across companies like FireEye, Cisco, McAfee, detecting threats. We spent the majority of our time trying to figure out um, how to detect the next virus, how to detect the next worm. And at FireEye, it became how to detect the next next nation state malware. And this is circa 2015 when I was still at FireEye, we were seeing more than 100,000 pieces of new malware a day. That number today is more than 350,000 pieces of new malware. And so while I had a front row seat to that, I started talking to CIOs and CISOs and everyone was telling me they were writing more software, they were hiding more developers, and all of the software as SaaS, software as a service applications were increasingly being deployed into the cloud. So that gave me the sense that maybe application security has to become more important. And then when I looked at application security, it was 180 degrees, uh, devoid of any notion of attackability. Um, you know, a modern application, for example, consists of APIs, open source libraries, SDKs, some custom logic that you've written. All of that comes together to manifest as an application that you host, let's say in AWS for the world to consume. And the way we try to find vulnerabilities is we analyze each of those piece, piece parts. We use a software composition analysis tool to find us, oh yeah, I have, a thousand libraries, how many of them are vulnerable? Oh, 200 of them. Golly, I gotta go upgrade all of them. And then we will do just analyzing of code that we've written and get a whole list of vulnerabilities. And I felt like this was broken, uh, that we are constantly getting inundated by vulnerabilities. Uh, Technical debt continues to mount every year. And I don't think it's an understatement to say that software is the weakest underbelly of the world economy. And so I felt that there was an opportunity to bring the attacker mindset to how we do application security. Because when we host our application, the attacker looks at it as one entity and tries to probe it, do automated recon to find the weaknesses and then uses those weaknesses to exploit the application. Um, And so as opposed to analyzing these parts of an application separately, we are the first company to analyze the entire application as one entity as the attacker sees it. Very good, very good. 
So in, in terms of the application security itself, have you seen a strong rise in that with, with the applications that are out there? Or there's still a long ways to go? We are still scratching the surface uh, as an industry, uh, not just as a young company. Um, you know, as an example, we spend um, total cybersecurity spend is roughly 100 billion. We spend about 20, 25 billion at least on network security, endpoint security tools, and application security is only about two and a half, three billion. Um, Interesting. Uh, you know, yet when we look at every company is developing software and every company is hosting the software on the internet to be accessible by everyone in the world. Um, I think we are, the, we are very early in, in the innings of application security. I mean, if you look at network and endpoint security, we've been spending money on these tools for the last 30 years. We are in 2020. We've been spending money on these tools for, since 1990. Application security is just getting started. So as an example, we have 28 million developers writing 111 billion lines of new code a year. That number is going to get to 35 million. And all of this code is just, just continuing to mount technical debt that we can't get underneath, get out of. We have to find a better way. Otherwise, hackers are just going to enjoy uh, stealing, uh, stealing things like candy in a candy store. So, so in terms of the security for the applications, from a layman's perspective here, um, is it the responsibility of the app developers to write uh, code in such a way or, or the, that generates the log files that the security teams can then ingress that into their tools and then manage and understand that? Yeah, good question. So, you know, when we think about 10 years ago, we used to use waterfall software development methodology. <clears throat> Um, I think all of us have enough white hair to remember that we would get like one software upgrade from Microsoft in six months. And so back in those waterfall days, it was okay to use one of those legacy tools, which you submit and you know you developed an application for a month, then you kicked off a scan. If it took a day, eh, no big deal. But fast forward to today, companies like Netflix and AWS have said that they make thousands of changes a day, right? Because the world of monolithic software has been broken down into microservices. And now we're going to Lambda functions, which allows us, our developers to develop software and deliver feature functionality very, very quickly. And so um, several things have changed. One is the speed. So application security no longer has the luxury to run a scan once a week. They have to run a scan every time a change happens. And the goal really needs to be in the industry that if you're the developer, Al, and you just made a change, within seconds to minutes, you should be told that Al, the change that you made caused this vulnerability to take place and you should therefore go fix it. You know, number one, you get feedback while the code change that you made is still fresh in your mind. Right, imagine if I came to you two, three weeks later, you would have forgotten about it. Your millions of lines of code are somewhere else. Exactly. Uh, second is, uh, you know, imagine if you had just made the change and we were gonna run a scan two weeks later, well, then maybe on top of your change, your colleague, Chris, made a change on top and then Jeremy made a change. And by the time I come back to you with a vulnerability, you said, man, I can't fix it anymore. I gotta talk to Chris and Jeremy. And that's way too complex. Let's just shove this under the carpet. So you're in there providing those tools then that are going to interrogate that app and for vulnerabilities during the development phase before it really gets finalized to production. Indeed, indeed. So we published a report uh, uh, recently where we took all the customer scans that customers have done with our solution over the last year and the median scan time of these hundreds and thousands of scans was two minutes and 20 seconds. That, that's pretty so, impressive. So Manish, are you in the, let's use the nasty Gartner term, DevSecOps or whatever you want to call it. Today. So are you in the build process of like GitHub and, and GitLab? So is that your main target? Yeah, exactly, Chris. So, you know, there are two ways to think about it. One is we can do code analysis when the developer is still working on her code, let's say in the IDE. Uh, but that 
we believe is shifting too far left. Why? Because imagine if you had your IDE and you were writing code and some tool was telling you, Chris, this is a mistake, this is a mistake. That's kind of like the annoying clippy in the Word document in Microsoft Word. You know, because in your IDE, you don't have libraries. Um, the code is not complete yet. And as you know, code, writing code is a creative exercise. If something keeps interrupting you, what's gonna happen sooner or later, you're just gonna ignore it. And the last thing that happens in the IDE is it's not enforceable by security. Tool tells you, don't, you know, this is a problem, go fix it. If you don't go fix it, security doesn't know that. So security still has to done a, do a scan later on. So that's why the ideal place is like you said, when the code and the libraries and the API and the SDKs all come together, which is the first time that it happens is that a pull request in GitHub or GitLab or whatever other CI pipeline you might be using. Okay, okay, so you, you're doing that piece and then obviously we were talking about like a lot of the build process, but you brought up an interesting point that one of the differentiators you have is that you're more holistic, right? You're looking at after the libraries have been pulled in, we're going to look at the totalitarian, totalitarian, the to <laughs> whatever the total word is that's supposed right. to fit in there. And, and uh, it's not even drinking much. And um, so the, but now are you doing, and again, we're going to go deep because the McAfee thing, we knew, we knew that in McAfee, there's the dynamic versus the static analysis of an executable. And so, you know, Veracode for a long time has been doing static analysis, but I'm getting the hint when you start talking about looking things as a combined package that you're looking at something a lot more than just static. You're looking at a lot of the dynamic aspects of it. Yeah, so it is you looking at the dynamic aspects, uh, but statically. Um, mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, you know, the, the deficiencies of the legacy technologies uh, like the ones that you mentioned is that they look at bits and parts of code. Mm -hmm. They don't look at the entire application. And so as a result, they create a lot of false positives. Uh, I actually have a report here. I can bring it out. One of our customers that has about 150 applications shared one such report for one application. And guess how many pages is that? 2,756 <laughs> 2, pages Damn. for one application, right? So we went through this, uh, a report uh, clearly we haven't gone through in its entirety, but we went through it. And of course, you know, vast majority of these are false positives because these vendors are just looking at your custom logic and not really seeing how your custom logic is connected to a library, which then maybe comes back to custom logic, which then goes to an API. And so you might have a taint that an attacker can reach in custom logic, but then as you've been using the library, perhaps to sanitize, well, that taint no longer exists. Right, right. And so this is why, because of the inaccuracy of static analysis, companies wanted to use more and more dynamic analysis like we did at McAfee. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, dynamic does have the advantage that it will give you very few, if any, false positives. This, the challenge with dynamic is it's not comprehensive. It can't be because you're asking a tool from the outside to treat your application as a black box and test all permutations combination, uh, not, uh, you know, not feasible. Um, and, you know, again, in the waterfall world, you could run a dynamic scan because it was so long of a release cycle, but when you're doing hundred changes a day, it's like, you don't have the time to do dynamic scan. Um, so, yeah, so that's the, those are the problems that we are solving, Chris. And, you know, we talked about code analysis, if, uh, which was, you know, the Veracodes of the world, but I think the same problem applies to software composition analysis. So without naming names, you know, there are companies that are trading, you know, they've just raised money at like $8 billion in valuation in the private market. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to one of our customers who is a FinTech customer last week, and they showed me a dashboard which had 1,896 libraries from this vendor that they were being told was vulnerable. 1,896. Now you're a developer, Chris, how long will it take for you to upgrade 1,896 libraries? Oh, good, right? Now, yeah, I mean, and you're getting to a really interesting point, right? So, so at the point, if you look at the Gartner universe, because I always like to make fun of them, 
it's about your DevOps, but you're beginning to talk about libraries, about other people's DevOps and the impact to you, right? So to take a really blah phrase supply chain, right? And it doesn't have to do with the fact my Christmas presents aren't getting here, um, <laughs> is that we have the issue of, of the supply chain of my libraries, right? So you're, you're including libraries as part of your builds, right? Which is significantly yeah. different. Indeed, uh, because you know our perspective is again, right? We want to take the attacker mindset mm. of how the attacker sees your application, and your application is a combination of all of these things. But it is way more than the sum of its parts. But at the same time, imagine let's say I'm not a developer myself, but I was recently taking a machine learning course, so I've used used the NumPy library in Python. Right. So let's say I'm using the transform function in NumPy. Okay. And that's the only function that I'm using. And the NumPy has like 100 plus functions. And let's say function number 10 is vulnerable. But I'm not using function number 10. So therefore, my application is not vulnerable. But in that 1896 list, my library will show up. It's like, hey, Manish, you got to upgrade. So we are chasing our tail constantly. And if you think about this from an attacker perspective, yes, you are using NumPy, but this, but the attacker can't reach this vulnerability because your code never touches it. So you're kind of shaking the code tree, right? I mean, yes. The build is a shake of the tree. Correct. So this, that's right. They're taking mul we're taking multiple compiler representations, Chris. And I know this is where you'll stump me because you're such a you're far smarter, more technical than me. I'm tricking. <laughs> I, I, that, that might be one advantage I have for on you. Um, I have a 5.3 alcohol beer. Ah. <laughs> yeah, drink, drink, drink some more. Catch up to my level of intelligence, please. Um, but yeah, th see, that's the thing. Like we take multiple compiler representations, like abstract syntax tree, control flow graph, program dependence graph, everything that is relevant in your application from a security point of view. Wow, you just brought something. That, see, I thought you were gonna have an easier time at it, but you just brought up something that kind of stunned me. So you, like one of the things we had a problem with the attackers is attackers would run it on different chipsets, therefore you'd have different compilations. So are you doing that? Are you actually going through variance changes to, to, to see the different impacts as you evaluate? Or is it just? So the, uh, the examples or rather chipset specific implementations uh, surface more in programming languages like C. C++, which we don't analyze today. We will next year. Our open source code product does analyze it. Uh, but there we're today doing fuzzy parsing, which is source code based. And um, I think the next step is for us to get hook into LLVM. We have to select one compiler. And yes, right. when we do that, we will uh, look at chipset specific implementations. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously when you do like a Go build, of course, you're looking at different OS impacts, of not really a chipset as much. Correct. Um, I know Jeremy's like, you, Jeremy, you want to jump in? Because I, I think we can one more and then you, you're going to jump in with your, doesn't he look almost, he's got the, it's confusing me because he's got the golden knights, but I see the green, I'm thinking leprechaun, I'm thinking like, <laughs> you know, he's, he's going for something yeah. different. Um, so so I want to get back to the, the a business question for you, because I, I find what you're doing fascinating and a lot more cutting edge than people might expect. Um, so you have Gartner in 20, like 2013, 2014, started really getting heavy into this, the dev sex ops kind of space. But yet at the same time, here you are building a company when Gartner doesn't know what they're doing yet, right? Gartner's just saying things and, and they're, they're seeing how it's absorbed by the industry and they're changing while they're talking. So how do you develop a product or keep your sanity of developing your product when people are changing your terms changing the objectives, changing the lingo, right? Um, I mean, I, did it drive you up the wall? I mean, how do you handle um, keeping the product focused when people are trying to redefine your world? That's a great question. I think the lesson that I've learned at FireEye, um, and I bring that example, the reason, because, you know, of course, we all know it is a very successful company. Um, Gartner never created a magic quadrant for a company like FireEyes Technology, never did. Um, they kept calling it a sandbox. Mm. And um, 
that everyone has a sandbox, McAfee, you know, et cetera. And um, I think we, I, I use the same principle here that as, as a true innovator, we are blazing the frontier, if you will, and I cannot expect uh, Gartner who appeals to the masses or wants to take you know, a majority opinion into their writing to, to cater to where we are trying to drive the market. We have to get them there. We just had something go by in Flinders or something. Yeah, that's my, that's my, unfortunately, my Gartner. Yeah, it's <laughs> a different type of, but we're talking Gartner. <laughs> Gartner. <laughs> I, I feel maybe that's part of their union. <laughs> so I, 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 do a, I do have a follow-up question before Jeremy jumps in, and that is, as you start pulling through and, and interrogating these libraries that, that are being put in by the developers, do you ever find scenarios where a mother daughter relationship in the libraries actually do expose, you know, secondary uh, paths of entry for the hackers? Great question. I think there are two elements of it, uh, Al. One, the majority of the cases are times, you know, because of the, um, the, the chain of libraries uh, that are connected to perhaps the one library that you um, started to use, majority of the times this creates false positives um, because you know some library down in the chain is called out to be vulnerable. And regardless of whether you're using it at all or not, it shows up in the traditional SCA vendors list as something that you have to upgrade. That's vast majority of the uh, times the issue. Few times or seldom, there is the opposite issue where, there, where this causes a false negative um, by our vendors, meaning the vulnerability is not identified even though this is making the application vulnerable. And we uh, wrote a blog about this because I'm trying to remember which one of the APIs, it's in the public domain now, so I can say it. Um, it I, I believe it was an IBM uh, or a VMware, I forget exactly which API, that we found was using a library that had a deserialization vulnerability. And because of the transitive nature, it was making the application vulnerable. And the API itself was not being called out by the vendor as being vulnerable. So when we saw this, we said, huh, that's very interesting. Let's go test another 10 APIs. And we found, I think like nine out of 10 to be vulnerable with the same vulnerability. Wow. That's amazing. So it, I know that, for example, and in, in, I'm going to go back over to an EDR component, right? Maybe like a Sentinel-1, sure. which is going to, when it installed the, the agent on the, the endpoint, it's going to do an analysis of the applications, right, and of the hardware. And then it's going to go check against this national vulnerability database. My question is, is there a similar database that's going to check the APIs or the libraries that can be referenced like that. Yeah, indeed. And, stole uh, my notes. Sorry? She Jerry. stole my notes. I'm <laughs> <stole them>. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Jeremy. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I now you've got me drunk and you, well, you have me on a beers and bites podcast. I'm going to get into dangerous territory now. But, you know, that's why I feel like SCA as a product should not exist. Like, what is it doing? There are, there are databases in the public domain like CVE, like NVD. Mm -hmm. And these vendors largely use these databases, you know, do some minor work on top and then essentially create an interface where they are comparing your set of libraries with this database to say, ah, you're vulnerable. That's the start and the end of this value proposition. Um, so yes, short answer to your question. Yes, there are databases like CD and NVD that people are using. Um, and I, I guess the colorful answer to that is um, that's not the value proposition. We don't want to be told things that we don't, we shouldn't be worrying about. If I, look, if you had more time in the world and you were twiddling your thumbs as an application security person, figuring out what to do, absolutely. Go upgrade those 10, 100 libraries. But if you are in the vast majority who is just barely making ends meet, 
then you gotta focus on the problems that the attacker is gonna be focused on. You gotta be focused on the attackability of the vulnerability in your application. And that's where you have to do the hard analysis that you know, we do. Uh, the case in point, the example to perhaps bring to here, uh, bring forth here is Equifax. Uh, we know they came out and they acknowledged that they knew they were using a vulnerable library. So it's very rare that if a company gets breached because of a vulnerability in open source library, you go back to them and say, did you know that this was vulnerable? And most often the answer will be yes. But unfortunately it is at one out of the 1,896. It's just unactionable. That, that plus I would submit that a lot of times these companies let their change control management, right? Get in the way of getting these things fixed and deployed on a timely basis. Yeah, because you know some of these times, some of these, look, to the extent this $8 billion company has done a great job of coming up with a way to automatically upgrade libraries if they're found vulnerable. And that I believe is like the hygiene level of security. If it can be upgraded, and if you, a quick unit test shows that it doesn't break your application, of course you should do it. Uh, but you know, as you start to become two, three years mature and more, while tech debt mount, starts to mount up, and now you're using a library that you haven't upgraded in the last two years, and it's being called vulnerable, upgrading is gonna call all kinds of havoc. You have to refactor code, you have to retest the whole uh, darn thing, and there comes in the question, do I really need to do this? Oh yeah, and in some cases, you mentioned FinTech earlier, you're gonna to have to certify some of that stuff. There we go. Which will even add more delays. Ah. Do you want to interrupt before just Al goes down your old cheat sheet? So, so, so Jeremy, I'm done yeah, asking. Yeah, I'm, enjo I'm enjoying the conversation. No, keep going. You're on I'm a roll, I'm done asking Al. softball you, questions, you, Jeremy. You go, sir. <laughs> you, you're following, you're, no, see, here's a softball question. What CWE, CVE, CVSS, what's the difference? And, 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 and which should we can trust or, or not trust and, and why? <laughs> um, well, they're just different classifications of the same underlying set of vulnerabilities. You know, they change every so often. Um, I don't put much weight into them myself because they are meant for a world where you are getting the 2,756 page report and devoid of any other information, you have to use categorization like CVE, CWE to say, oh yeah, this has a score of 10 and I cannot go fix everything in this 2700 page report. Let me find out which ones I'm gonna go fix. But yeah. it is, again, it is driving attention to the wrong, wrong problem because as an example, you might be going and fixing the vulnerability of the highest severity but guess what? It's not attacker. It's not attackable. Attacker can't get to it. You just wasted your time. So Manish is because we've talked a lot about libraries, and, and your value is more than just libraries, right? Is the reviewing of the code by the developers themselves while they do the submit. So library is just a very small portion of that, correct? I mean, you you do a lot of other checks about the actual code being submitted. You're right, Chris, and unfortunately, because the world is so used to talking in these silos, we've been using these tools for 20 years, so they've become part of our everyday language, at least in application security. Yeah. Um, hey, are you analyzing libraries? Are you analyzing APIs? Are you analyzing SDKs? Are you analyzing custom logic? But look, you and I both know when you create an application and you host it, the attacker doesn't get up Monday morning and saying, you know what, today I'm going to go after libraries because I'm going to save Tuesday for custom logic. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you, 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 I guess what I'm trying to just highlight is the strength of what you're doing, right? It's, listen, I mean, I can do an NPM build and it can yell at me and say, look at Chris, these libraries aren't great libraries. Yes. Big deal, right? Like you're saying, I can shake it out. But the, the other issue is, is that you still have to write good code. Now, you also said that season on is already in the open source community. You're moving it towards in, in product um, or C++, I should say. What, C what, other, 
What are the languages right now that Shift Left is the strongest on? Yeah, so we support Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Python, TypeScript. Um, what did I miss? Golang, Scala. Wow, you do Golang. Now, why Golang? Because I would have thought since Golang is such a type strong language that, that you would have saved that to last thinking, okay, yes. this sucker's not going to be as broken. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think it was driven largely by a customer need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some customer who was probably using Java, or do, I don't know the details, but yeah, it was driven by customer demand. Okay, and you also did a really good distinction. I appreciate it. The difference between JavaScript and TypeScript. Yes. So, so is are you finding significant issues with TypeScript when it gets implemented? Not as many clearly as JavaScript, which is the I think which is is it fair to say the wild wild west. Um, I would say Python is, but JavaScript <laughs> is number two. Um, I, I mean, I, I do a lot of it. Listen, I think JavaScript is, how can I say it? It's, it's the, uh, the crayons of the coding world. But you <laughs> yeah. can do some beautiful stuff with crayons. Yes. Right? Um, and, and like, I mean, you can take a, there's no such thing as a, as a restricted word. I can redefine my words yep. um, anytime I want. And, and that can make for some fun you know, uh, program interception. And, and, and the funny thing is I can give you a, a JSON blob yeah. and the JSON blob actually have a functional block that can execute itself. So yeah. it's, it's a fun language. There's nothing secure about it. I'll be 100% agree <laughs> on that one. So, so you can write all day long, write checks on that one. That's just crazy <laughs> talk. Um, so, so but, the, but the strength, so, so to go over, cause I, I want to make sure I got JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, you did Golang, you did what C standard? C sharp. C sharp. No, C. Yep. Okay. Now, what was what was what was interesting about C sharp? Why did you pick that one? Again, is it customer need? No. So C sharp. Uh, you know, lots of there are lots of Microsoft uh, uh, gravitational centers. I mean, especially Wall Street has a lot. I mean, not just Wall Street. I would say lots of large uh, companies that have been around Fortune five hundred companies. There's a ton of code that they've written in C sharp. Ton. Wow. And wow. they continue to write it. So did, did, right. Now you continue to go into a very advanced language, right? I mean, they just hit the 1.0, yep. but what's the, um, now are you doing anything like silly, stupid, like you're doing COBOL or, or, you know, any of that kind of stuff? I, I know there's big money in programming it, but is there big money in checking it? We have been asked by some of the customers in Wall Street to do COBOL, but no, uh, that's okay. not on our plans yet. Okay. And, and so I'm going to ask you a business question and Jeremy, jump in anytime. Is I know you're going to jump in. Is um, so so from a business perspective, like I just kind of hinted. I mean, how do you? This is a huge. You're trying to solve solve a huge problem, right? I, next year we're going to meet you. We're going to do this again. You're going to be bald because this is such a huge issue. Um, so so from a business perspective, how do you roadmap? How do you decide what's important? You know, if you were to sit there and talk to a person starting a company saying, listen, you, you need to focus. And this is, this is how you find your focus. I mean, what is the, what, what, what is the focus of left shift that drives it as it decides what deserves to be in the roadmap? Yeah, um, that's not an easy and question to answer, Chris. And I think that's- That's why I put it at the end. <laughs> put it at the end, you know, to try to like, you give as much time as you want. Yeah, it's that's right. Easy. Yeah, I think we, we just have to constantly, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of giving you a blase answer. So maybe I, I give it some thought. Um, okay, well, I'll take you off the spot then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, come on, I, I really wanna know. Listen, I mean, you guys, you, guys, you, guys, you guys got from this year and he, he kind of has a golden touch, okay? <laughs> And, and, and part of it is he has a good, he's always been very strong on roadmap. I, I, I want the answer. You guys are. All you right. All off. right. All right. Well, he might have to go get a 10% beer now. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I mean, is it, is it, does the board tell you, do you do shorter? Uh, we're just going to focus on three or six months. Do you really, do you really stand by your one year or do you, do you, are you very fast in pivoting? What makes a good roadmap? Is it a good roadmap as long as the, I understand I'm making money or is it a good roadmap? I'm really going to look five years down the road like I'm, I'm stalled. Yeah, I, I think there are two important things that drive our thinking. 
uh, one long-term roadmap, strategic roadmap, as I like to call it, has to be driven by us. Okay. We have to validate it. Uh, but you know, uh, my thinking there is, if five years ago I was asking customers, hey, is this a problem I should solve in this manner? No one would have told me yes. Right? It's the same thing that we say, right? Right? I mean, if we ask the buggy drivers in New York City back then, right? So it's the same logic. That's so, a forward statement, right? Right. So strategic roadmap has to be driven by our core beliefs of where we want to take the world. The tactical roadmap, I think, has to be informed much more by customers. Mm. Yes, we have certain resources we dedicate to uh, partners. That's okay. It's a good answer. So I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the, the vacuum. Yeah, the keep, keep going. Yeah, so, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we have a certain percentage of our resources that we like to dedicate to strategic roadmap because we, we, need, we need to be driving that vision. Um, and then there's certain percentages, certain percentage of our resources that are dedicated to tactical. And that is where like, we might believe that we should do uh, Kotlin next. But when we go and talk to our customers, they might say, no, 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 you should be doing uh, Ruby. As mm -hmm. much as I would dislike to do Ruby. Um, but yeah, in that case, we will say, okay, fine. We'll go do Ruby because it, it drives revenue in the short term. All right, so, so what do we do? What do we a strategic decision? So a tactical decision is really trying, deciding what flavor of something. So a strategic decision is one that says what? I'm gonna go after libraries. What, what would you be a strategic decision? For? Yeah, so if you, uh, if you boil the essence of shift left down, it's really a mingling of my attacker centric background, Chris, from the days you and I worked together to the application security world. I like to say companies that are in the attacker world like McAfee, we are outside in. We are always looking at the attacker and what he could be doing. The folks in the application security world are always inside out. We look at individual components of an application and say, oh yeah, here is this massive list of vulnerabilities. So the core uh, innovation at shift left is to bring these two worlds together and create this notion of attackability in an, in an application. We have shown that it works for code analysis, static application security testing as Gartner calls it. We've shown, and the, re, the proof point is instead of 2,756 page report, we will give you a handful of vulnerabilities. As if you insert this at the developer pull request, we will give you like two or three, that's it. So why didn't you have just started that whole conversation an hour ago with that? That's, that's, that is a really good point, right? That I think that if you were to sum it up before Jeremy goes back to, Jeremy's gonna ask Jeremy questions, is you know there's the 80-20, the right? The 20% drives the 80%, right? And then of course, there's a 464. If you do it the 80-20 again, you realize 4% drives to 64% or yeah, 64%. So, so the point here is, is that one of the bigger issues we have is the fact we can't solve everything. So if you can tell me, here's the handful of things you need to solve today, I can do that for you. Exactly. Right? If I take away the most likely avenues of attack, granted, there's still going to be more, but I'm going to cover more issues right now in the next month than you're going to cover in the next year if you do it randomly. All right? Okay, I, I get it now. I get it now. All right, Jeremy, go ahead and ask your right, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy's going to ask you where oh, babies what? come from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, hey, listen, I've, I've got interesting questions. Maybe you don't want to hear them. Maybe I need to open my my second beer first. There you there go. You go. Are, you, are you in a second beer already go. yet? So let's ask the first, uh, the most basic question. Could shift left have prevented Twitch's breach? Or which breach? Twitch. 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 I don't even know what were the details of that breach. Can you educate me? Nah, I mean, it was a it bunch of different colliding okay. together. Yeah, it would take too much time to. Okay, never mind on that one. Um, how about OWASP benchmarking? Oh, totally. Have you ever participated in the OWASP benchmarking process? And how, Excellent how, question. How did you guys fare in that? So we have the highest score, Jeremy, of 75% in the OWASP benchmark. Um, the second best company is at about 32, 33%. Okay. 
What was your what was your number? 70? 75. 75. That's You're a C. significant. So the best OAuth is a C. Yes. In, 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 in every year, <laughs> but except for the more competitive schools. But a C. <laughs> It is I mean that's that's fast. but I mean you're more than you're more than twice as effective as Correct. the next product on the market. I mean that Correct. speaks volumes to your capability. So to that that's end crazy. for our listeners, how is your product priced or what is your what is your model if someone's interested in implementing this for themselves? Yeah, Jeremy, we price on a number of developer bases. So, you know, it is whatever roughly thousand dollars list price per developer per year. There's a free entry point, Jeremy. Trust me, I went there like, ooh, free, yes. free, <laughs> uh, free, free ninety nine is my favorite. That's right. Yeah, no free, free, no freemium model. There is a freemium model, <laughs> and there is a self serve model. We became the first company in our space to offer self serve. So, for example, if you have GitHub, GitLab credentials, you can just log into one of those resources, uh, look in the marketplace, you will find Shift Left app, submit your app get results in a matter of seconds to minutes, all for free, as long as you are less than five developers forever in life. Yeah, see, well, wait, wait, we're not five developers. I thought it was five, five employees. I was gonna say, you, you're, oh. you're, you're not there yet. <laughs> I don't have, it's my employees or developers. That's, I, <laughs> oh, that's well, fantastic. No, that's, a, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you're definitely yeah, giving back to the community. I mean, that's showing, that's showing a, a commitment to the space. Right. Actually, by, you know, by making was, your was, tool, yeah, I was blown away. Available. It was profitable. I was blown away when I look at your price sheet, and then you told me you're profitable. I'm like, I don't know how he does it. Right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, that's magic. Yeah. Oh, there's there's a big need in the marketplace for sure. There is, but it's not like it's not like like oh, I gotta have this. I gotta do it for compliance, right? Because because everybody's gonna say, you know what? I'll just run Nessus scanner and I'll do an NPM result scan. Right. right. Uh, AWS came out with their new intercept module capability. Um, but this is a different animal and I find it fascinating that it's got such good legs. Um, and and it, rightfully so, right? It's something that Gartner used to talk a lot of and you don't hear about it anymore. That's the reason why I was kind of asking that Gartner thing. All right, Jeremy, go back. I, 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 I love listening to you talk, Chris. So it's all good. <laughs> 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 so as an Intel alum, what did, uh, as a fellow Intel alum, what was your, uh, what was your role there? Uh, what was my role? Um, so I was uh, head of products for the network security business unit, as I recall. Okay. Um, yeah, that's when I got a chance to work with Chris very closely. We had uh, we had acquired his company, which did the NTR product. Network yeah, the NTR is the strangest anomaly ever from Acme. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that was, I mean, would you say, Chris, that that was the most exciting BU within McAfee? What, with the- uh, Network the, security? Listen, I think that McAfee was highly underrated in network security. I think the interest show group was uh, a very strong uh, forward looking group. It was, it, I, th I think that uh, when people think of McAfee, they think of the software they run at their home. It was such a different company back then. And, and they're trying very hard right now to recapture that. They really are. Um, it's just that the industry has moved so fast. And this is a completely different beer discussion. I mean, <laughs> the, the industry has really moved so quickly. And to tell you the truth, the, the network is, is gone. It's absolutely gone. Um, I mean, if you look at everything we're doing, Jeremy, with, with SD-WAN and, and, and where the data is coming from, from EDR, I mean, I can reconstruct an entire network without ever seeing the network pulling up EDR data. So I, I think that, that that is, you know, the, the, again, you know, Manish, to, to kind of blow more sunshine up your butt is you, you really knew where to land because you, you realize, oh my God, I can't do a network product. The network's you know, if Gartner, Gartner said IDS died in 2000, they should have said yeah. the network died in 2020, 2019, you know, <laughs> and, and so I think that you, you kind of had something there that told you, I need to move to this, I need to move to code, right, I need to get away from the network, and, and that's where I think, you know, your brilliance was, was that you take a look at FireEye, FireEye was so cutting edge, like you said, Gartner didn't know how to describe it, um, in fact, Gartner never still does not understand the, the main concepts behind, you know, what NTR was and FireEye was. 
Um, and now you're moving to an area where Gartner talked about it really hot and heavy. And, and for some reason, it doesn't seem the same importance after COVID, even though it should be more important, right? Because what you're talking about is in the SaaS model, let's, 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 let's really talk about this. In the SaaS model, there is no open source, yep. right? You look at Alaska and you say, Alaska, show me how you manage your cloud. Yep. They won't do it. Right. In fact, all these SaaS products roll themselves off and there's not a single line of code that anybody can review. That's right. So how do you know this place is not about to just give it to everybody? You just brought Twitch, you, brought, you can go down the laundry list, right? That right now code is the most insecure it's ever been. And we want to talk about, I don't know, it depends if you're CNN or Fox, but I'll tell you what you're not talking about is security, right? You're not talking about the, the cloud security. You, a guy in the Pentagon responsible for securing the network wants to talk about why he shouldn't have an AI budget. Well, because your job was to buy other people's products to secure the Pentagon, not perform R&D. Yes. So anyways, I, I'm on my soapbox. That's what happens, trick number two, Jeremy. <laughs> Uh, I, I can redirect us. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, just, 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 just yeah. lay them down, get the pylons, say Chris, just, but, but the point right, is, how, how about, go, go. I was going to have a point, but it finished your point. But Which, what my, my, my point was, was that, you know, there was all this huge hubbub about secure development and when it became the most important time to do something about it, Garden decided, I don't know. What Gartner decided, I have no clue what Gartner thinks is important anymore. I think Gartner thinks, besides paying themselves money, I don't know what Gartner thinks the most important thing is anymore. Yeah, I think the um, <laughs> we need to be, you know, like, for example, one of the, we, we've had a lot of good questions and hopefully somewhat meaningful answers. <laughs> um, but, you know, like one of the questions that uh, you haven't asked me that I would love to uh, volunteer to answer. We talked a lot about technology. We, looked, we, looked, we talked a lot about like, how do we do it? But at the end of the day, and I think this is one of the challenges uh, in many fields of security, especially application security, what do you think should be the one metric for application security? You're gonna give me the answer. You can't just ask me that question. Okay, what's the answer? Uh -huh. it, it, well, shouldn't it be what number of, what percentage of vulnerabilities we fixed how quickly? That, or mm. I would suggest maybe how sloppy was your coding? No, 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 oh. no. You, don't, you misunderstand the question. No. No, I, so think when, I, I think so I do when, understand. But what this should get into is the fault tolerance number, which basically back in the 70s, what we realized was, was that the increment between one vulnerability and the next and how many you could discover tells you how many you've gotten rid of. And that if you, if you if you continually do it and you're slowly getting less and less and get more code time underneath it, that's a very, very important metric. I mean, to tell you the truth, Manish, that is the metric we use in-house for fluency is how many hours that code is run. There we go, right? And so now I don't find it anywhere within application security. The application security metrics are, Oh, here is the list of vulnerabilities I found. Oh, look, my list is bigger than your list. And I win, therefore. Well, so yesterday you did not have a tool and you were therefore in this ignorance bliss that perhaps you have zero. Today you ran a tool and it told you thousand vulnerabilities. Because of the volume, you, do, you can't do anything. Did it really make you better? Are you feeling better at night? No. And so that is the one belief, you know, one was this whole attackability and code analysis, uh, Chris, that uh, I talked about, but the other North Star metric that I like to say for shift left is what percentage of vulnerabilities are our customers fixing how quickly? And one of the things that I'm most proud of at shift left is we, again, we talked about the shifting left progress report that we published right. that we found that customers who automate shift left in their pipeline, meaning every time a pull request is done, shift left runs the analysis, shows the developer the vulnerabilities, you'll get a kick out of this. They fix 91.4% of the vulnerabilities in one to two sprints. And in these customers, a typical sprint is about week to 10 days. So meaning 91.4% of the vulnerabilities that we find, they fix. 
in 20 days. So, so you use it because it's a model, right? Like cheap asses like me, which I can run it and you're still getting feedback. So you're getting a lot of code analysis done, yep. right? Like compared to a lot of your competitors and I'm not going to say it now, I was originally going to talk about competitors, but, but I think that you're a lot of the competitor models, you have to pay to even see the results, right? But yeah, you have to pay to see the results. And unfortunately, Chris, uh, application security is still in the stone age like many of the tools require you to have on-prem hard you know hardware and code analysis is a very compute and memory intensive um, uh, application so many times i i ask my customers and they're buying one of the on-prem tools and they're having to say oh in the next year i will develop so much code and therefore i'm going to need so many scans and therefore i'm going to need the, these many servers and mr vendor charge me for the anticipated number of scans that I'm going to do. Like even in our small companies, I bet you we are not even like 70, 60% accurate in being able to predict what our code is going to be over the next 12 months. I mean, let alone these enterprises who have 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 developers. All right, Jeremy, I have one more question you can ask because I have to ask this one. What customer support software do you use? I'm really dying on customer support software. Jeremy's using Halo. Yeah. I, I was using Zendesk before. I was very disappointed with it. Uh, yeah. What are you using right now for customer support software? I have no idea. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Get me that and let me know because because that is, I'm, I'm hurting on that one. All right, Jeremy, go ahead. I owe you that answer. Thank you. <laughs> Bring us home, Jeremy. Oh, we're, right. we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour now. No, we're going to cut out a lot of the, the, error. Oh. the vacuuming and the, the, the lawn leaf blowing and Chris's ranting, all going to be cut. So, <laughs> all right. So, we'll, we'll do the lightning round. We'll like to <laughs> go like Jim Cramer does. Right. Um, ready? Yeah. What does Manish like to do in his spare time? Golf. Golf? Golf? Yep. Yes, That's it? Yep. I guess that takes up a lot of time. That's good. <laughs> okay. Yes. What is uh, the one thing you would say to a budding entrepreneur? Do it. Just do it. Wow. You're taking uh, no credit to Nike for that phrase. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonar Cube, good or bad? Horrible. Horrible? Yes, sir. All right. Well, lightning round over. All right, so I've, I've got a final question as we begin to wrap up here. So Manish, you, you've written articles relative to the remote workforce is here to stay, right? But how is it going to impact DevOps? And then just as importantly, what are some of the downfalls? So if you can talk to that a little bit. Oh, like, great question. You... It allows us to go beyond the tech speak. I, I love the that as sort of the bring us home question. Uh, look, I was fortunate that when I when we started the company, my partner in crime, my founder CTO, the gentleman by the name Chetan Konaki, many many times smarter than me, but you know he had this notion from the beginning that Silicon Valley does not have a monopoly on talent, and so we should hire wherever we find people. So literally from day one, we have been a very remote friendly company. I mean. Look, we are a young company, but I think we have people in like 12 countries, Brazil, Argentina, Poland, uh, um, Ukraine, England, maybe Ukraine, uh, Luxembourg, right? So, uh, so we've been remote uh, from day one. COVID uh, actually made our customers remote and accelerated their digital roadmap, which was good. But coming back to like, what are the downsides? Uh, I find that people who are... Uh, uh, more mature, I was going to use the word old, or maybe audience may not like it. Um, uh, you know, we are used to brainstorming in person. And I miss that. And so over the last two, three months, since the COVID number cases have gone down in California, um, I asked my executive team to come to the office once or twice a week. And we just sit around and, you know, we have lunch and we break bread together and we just, you know, we just brainstorm. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be about the company. Uh, it is also important to learn um, how other people are 
facing the pandemic. My children are older. Um, they're out of the household. So I, you know, we don't have those challenges, but some of our other younger employees, you know, they live, live in small apartments. They may have a kid and COVID has been most challenging for them. Um, so appreciating and what we can therefore do for those employees is, you know, priority number one. Uh, agreed. Yeah, we, I think we used to call that water cooler talk back in the day. <laughs> Not That's to date funny. myself. <laughs> Yeah. So as, as you look at these these different time zones that you have in the, the various employees, any challenges there? Because that, that seems to be a, a challenge sometimes, getting people to connect. Indeed, but I think the world has become much more used to it with the, with the, with the process, workflow processes like GitHub. Um, in, mm -hmm. you know, people are developing code in parallel regardless of where and merging it into the main line. Um, tools like Slack. Um, I'm the only one who seems to be using email at shift left. <laughs> um, me and my sales guys. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think those collaborative tools, Zoom, of course, has made a ton of difference. Although our usage of Zoom internally skyrocketed when COVID started and then just uh, completely eliminated because developers don't want to be on Zoom. Um, they they want to be you know, much more sort of interactive asynchronous communication. I understand for sure. Well, well listen, I know, I know we're, we're at the hour mark and you had a final question, Jeremy? Any final no, thoughts? I was going to say Slack has the new huddle feature, right? Which is fantastic. So really, unless you're uh, working with somebody outside your organization, there's no need for Zoom. That's right. That's exactly right. So Chris, any final thoughts as we start to wind up the this episode? Yeah, Chris hit his word quota about two thirds of the way in. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he ramps he back. That now. When, he, that when now. he gets that second beer, he'll ramp back up. So <laughs> I'm the second. <laughs> anyway, well, listen, Manish, thank you so much. We uh, very much enjoyed and appreciated the time this evening and. And we wish you all the best because it's certainly an area that needs to be addressed. Yeah, so thank it's, you, it's a great spot. Yeah, thank you, Al. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Chris, for reaching yeah. out. I will admit I was nervous. Um, whenever, you know, the, you know Chris, I, I truly mean when I say that Chris was one of the smartest people I got a chance to work at McAfee. I, I, I thought he was going to ask me some hard questions that I would have <laughs> no answers for. Um, but uh, it's good that he was in his second beer. That's the only way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. 